Yes. So is it on, on that screen? Okay, so there's a, there's a pointer, right, for those who are online? Yes. Yeah. Can okay, use this one. Okay. Well, that's good. Thank you. It's okay. Use this chair. So today we're going to cover uh, exploration in RL. Uh, just a reminder that we're two weeks so we're at the end of the course, and that means steps is rapidly approaching. And as you know, because you've watched the video, Sergey often warns his students that the RL takes time. So uh, if you haven't already started or gotten somewhere along your research, yeah, it's time to really put the pedal to the metal. Um, yeah, so that's a requirement of the course. You do have to present a project, and uh, although there's no grading because it's a community course, um, you know, there, we, we do look forward to your interactions with uh, uh, your peers in the class as well as the greater community because I think there's a lot of interest in RL. And, and so um, I know it's always difficult in the last couple of weeks to pull together any bandwidth to do things, but hopefully you have been forewarned and making forward progress. Okay? If there are any mitigating circumstances that you need to tell us about, you can DM me. Or, or be public about it and talk about it on the project's channel. Okay, so without further ado, we'll have Alexandra start uh, by talking about the first part of the exploration. Yeah, the first part was, uh, it, it's about the, diff, the, the, the concept of exploration and why it's a, why it's a problem. Um, the, the lecturer in the online course gives the example of uh, two old games, one is Atari and the other one is uh, Montezuma's Revenge. Uh, so they are, um, and this is the Commodore 64 version of Montezuma's Revenge, but I think it's the same idea. So it's a, a, a complicated platform game of it. Um, and it's, and then Atari is just, uh, um, the, the breakout is, uh, is just a, a, a game where you have to break bricks, you know? So, um, the Montezuma's Revenge, the one on the left here, is uh, very difficult to um, to to solve. I mean, to to perform well with a reinforcement learning uh, agent, and uh, there are um, there are several reasons uh, for that. And uh, the, the the first reason uh, is that there are a lot of symbols in there. So there is a skull, the the, the little. Uh, key, uh, the door, and uh, the daemon, and all those things. So uh, we, as human, we have a, a prior understanding of, of, of the meaning of, of those symbols because of our daily experience. Uh, if the game was such designed that uh, the, uh, the skull is a, is a reward and, uh, and the keys uh, random, do random things, it would be a bit more difficult for us to understand it at first. Um, and, and so uh, for, for re reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, which is usually not trained to understand the meaning of symbols, it's quite, uh, the, the, the cold start is much harder. And then um, if we put a human in a similar situation, and they give the example of the Ma game of Mao, which is a card game where uh, you don't know the rules in advance, and you have to get them and they're made. I'm not sure exactly what the rules are, they may be, they may be more they may be more or less arbitrary, but uh, but uh, if you put a human in the in the same situation, they perform much less well than on Montezuma's Revenge because they don't they don't have much clues about what it's about. So they they perform more like a reinforcement learning algorithm from a blank state. Although I think humans still have a prior understanding about card games that maybe helps them to derive some rules, but still. Uh, so with all this, uh, sim this symbolism or with all the prior knowledge that can be reused, then it's much more difficult for humans as well. So it's not something, um, it's, it's something about the task, about Montezuma Revenge, which makes it designed for humans. Uh, and then um, the, the other uh, thing that's difficult about Montezuma Revenge is that it's a, a temporarily extended sequence of, I mean, what's required to, to, to achieve uh, the ultimate goal is a temporary extended sequence of actions, and they are hard to discover for an algorithm. Um, there is something that humans have uh, um, that is that they are 
curious and they have this prior knowledge and they they have some heuristics that they learned uh, in their life that helps them guide them towards the goal but for reinforcement learning agent is quite difficult so uh, this is the essence of the problem um, that uh, I mean the, the last point right the, the, the point about temporary extended sequence of actions uh, the, the sensor problem is that uh, high reward strategies uh, that require an extended sequence of actions that are not individually rewarding in the sense of the reward function um, are not likely to be selected by a reinforcement learning algorithm in general. And um, in particular, when there are other sequence of actions which give some reward and which are simpler and already known by the agent. So, uh, so, so the, the, the first thing, the high reward, the discovery of the high reward strategies uh, is, is what's called exploration and the uh, exploitation is the, uh, the second thing. When, when you just go for what you know, it will give you some reward, right? So the, um, the, this, uh, this dilemma is, is what we are trying to study during, during this whole course through different uh, algorithms. Uh, you're doing new things in hope of getting a higher reward and uh, doing what you know uh, will really yield the highest reward. All those things seem to be about the design of the reward function. Uh, and um, if we look at uh, humans themselves, I mean, outside of the framework of reinforcement learning algorithm, it may be about uh, reward functions because humans uh, are modifying their own reward function and uh, in particular, given a particular task, uh, they, uh, they, they, may, they learn, they, they change their reward function, make it more sensitive to the environment, they learn to enjoy something maybe, like that. But re reinforcement learning algorithms don't do that because by design from the start, it's not allowed for reinforcement learning algorithm to uh, change the reward function. So all we can do is design reward functions and give them to the algorithm. So what we could do is, is make very, very complicated reward functions and give them to the algorithm that will help them to progress. But this kind of sidestepping the problem of uh, of uh, exploration by just you know guiding it more, but that's not something very fundamental. That's a that's a very time-consuming task that doesn't say much about um, about the uh, the fundamental trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Uh, Okay, so to search for the optimal exploration strategy, first we need to define what optimal means. So uh, optimal in, um, often is, it, it, it's, uh, it refers to the, the regret, which is a quantity which is defined as such. So you have a, uh, a perfect, perfect trajectory, a perfect uh, um, algorithm that would already know what the ideal action at each time step is. Uh, so this would, would accumulate the most um, expected reward. It will have the highest expected reward. And so you're going to take that one, that uh, ideal um, algorithm, and uh, subtract from it the sum of, re of the rewards that your algorithm obtained at each time step. So it's going to be called the regret. Uh, we'll come back uh, to it later when we'll be talking about the bandits. So. Uh, the ban I mean, the bandits are a class of a, uh, problems, reinforcement learning problems that are interesting because we can uh, talk about them um, in, uh, we, we can derive for them theoretically, uh, I mean, provably optimal um, exploration strategies. And we can generally understand uh, the properties of their algorithm so that then later when uh, we look at uh, infinite uh, or I mean larger problems like uh, continuous um, uh, mark of decision processes or uh, other similar problems then we can uh, take inspiration from uh, from those uh, multi-arm bandit algorithms and uh, create algorithms that are hopefully also good because you know we showed that in the simple context they were quite good uh, so, um, well, that's a one-arm bandit, that's where the, the name comes from, that's a slot machine. And uh, a multi-arm bandit is just a collection of slot machines. Those slot machines are independent from each other, and they don't necessarily have the same expected reward. So, uh, I don't know, I mean, I suppose you all know how this works, but what you do is that you pull 
one arm, you, you, you take one action, you choose which, one, which machine you want to play, and then you are going to get a, a reward. It's conditioned, of course, on which action, I mean, on which machine you chose. So, um, at, at each turn, we take uh, we choose an action, and if we know the expected reward, uh, here I, I wrote it to start, I'm sure it's denoted like that in the lecture, but if we, cho cho if we know exactly the expected reward from each machine, we know, of course, which action to take. We take the one with the highest expected reward, but uh, the, the problem is that we don't know the action values. Um, so, the whole, uh, that, that's an example of a, a reward, uh, uh, a multi-arm bandit problem. Here, um, it's showing the, um, uh, it's a Gaussian bandit problem with 10 arms. So those are the um, the Q stars, so the, um, the, the the quantities that we are trying to, um, to, 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 find, to find, right? The, 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 here, the optimal arm is the arm number three. Um, I don't know it in advance. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, a setting that I took from, a, from another book. But uh, just uh, to illustrate what it looks like. So, he, in this particular example, <coughs> the authors took, sampled the, the Q stars. Uh, when creating a problem, they sampled the Q, star, Q stars from a, 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 unif, a uniform, I mean, from, from a Gaussian with a, a variance of one and a mean of zero, so that um, they already know. So, they have a prior on the on the uh, on the Q star on, on the on the distribution of those uh, Q stars among the arms, so that's useful for later. Something that's commonly done because uh, it's useful then for, for for Bayesian methods, for instance, when you are going to start with prior distribution on the on the on the parameters. So here in all the R looks strange. So here the uh, yeah, so this is what uh, what we are saying here, right? So we have this uh, we have this uh, um, prior on theta. Uh, we have a reward function, like usual. I mean, the, the rest is quite similar to the to the reinforcement learning problems. But here we are going to define uh, to define a um, a higher level uh, problem based on this bandit problem. So so the bandit problem says that we have a reward function, right? It uh, it's uh, the reward is, is sampled from the uh, from the from the arm from the arm's um, random variable, and uh, and we denote uh, p uh, theta i r, 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 of r i the uh, probability function of the random variable r i. So uh, the distribution of um, of r i of each uh, each random variable of each arm. Is parameterized by a vector, and we have we assume that we have a prior on this vector. So, uh, in the in the previous slide here, I said, oh, the uh, the prior that we have on the vector of Q stars, we don't know the Q stars here. I'm showing them, but we shouldn't know them. The prior that we have on the vector of Q stars is that it's uh, a Gaussian. They are sampled from a Gaussian with a mean of zero and uh, a variance of one. In, in this particular example, in general, it's useful to have some prior. Uh, then, um, based on that, we are going to define a um, we are going to define a, a partially observable Markov decision process. Uh, that, so, partially, uh, a, a problem DP uh, is defined by uh, those six things, right? There is a state space, an action space, an observation space, a transition operator, an emission probability distribution, and a reward function. Uh, but that's not a uh, POM DP that, that, that the POM DP doesn't represent um, the bandit problem. It represents our reasoning about it. So uh, the, the state base, for instance, there's only one state. So it's a bit of a degenerate kind of uh, partially observable Markov decision process because there is only one state. Uh, I suppose when, when, you, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you're a reinforcement learning uh, researcher, everything looks like a Markov decision process. So in this case, you have a uh, you have a, a, a state space with only one space, but remember that it's par partially observable, uh, so so we don't actually know that state, right? So we need to we need to guess it, somehow. we need to find out what it. Is. So this uh, this state space represents the um, these parameters, right? Those Q stars, 
the, the, uh, or, or if, if the variance also was uh, was something non-fixed here, it's one. But if the variance was also uh, random, there would also be those variances in there. So we have this state space uh, that we don't know about, and we have the observation space. The observation space is the rewards that we get when we are playing the the arms, right? So um, from these rewards, we need to derive a belief about our state, and uh, the belief of, about our state is what will guide our exploration. Uh, the action space are just the K arms. So here we are. I mean, it's just things that are taken directly from the from the bandit problems. And the transition operator is, is just a trivial. Just a, I mean, there is no there is only one state, so there, there, there is no transition. The emission probability distribution is uh, well is defined by uh, because you know we are pulling an arm and you get a, a reward that is defined by um, your parameters from your from your arms, right? From your arms. So the, from your random variables underlying those arms, from those RIs. So the um, the emission probability distribution is just defined by the unknown state. And the reward function are the rewards. So all those things are trivial. Uh, and uh, what we try to do, uh, what I try to do actually <laughs> manually is uh, go through the, uh, a, a, you know, a uh, Bayesian belief update uh, starting from some prior that we got from the problem definition, right? We got the prior uh, theta i. And um, the, 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 sorry, the prior p of theta, which uh, from which the theta i are drawn. And then uh, from uh, this prior, we use, um, we use the, our knowledge of the problem. So our, um, our likelihood function, or like uh, our likelihood, yes. Uh, to uh, to derive a posterior each time we observe a reward. Uh, so through, by doing this uh, iteratively, we can do planning through the through the partial, partial, partially observable Markov decision process. Um, so I tried to do that by myself, and um, I, there's just one thing that's a bit unclear for me. It's uh, how uh, so. So I'm just asking you guys uh, how uh, so. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to do something to those slides one second because I um, cannot edit them here. But the problem is that um, once I have done one update, I'm just going to unhide some slides that I had hidden. But um, uh, how do I do this? Uh, no, don't skip. Okay, and I'm going to just reload this here. And then present again. Yeah. Uh, uh, where was I? Yeah. Okay. So, can you redo this uh, this uh, uh, planning for the meta uh, for the partially uh, observable Markov decision process? So, um, once we do, um, um, so let's say we we have a. a um, uniform prior, uh, which is uh, the same as a beta with one and one as parameters for each of two actions in a two binary bandit uh, um, problem. So um, the prior is is, uh, is quite an informative, it's just a flat line, right? Because it's, uh, and then we, are, we, we calculate the, uh, and we have a binomial likelihood because of the problem. Uh, it's, a, it's a binary uh, sampling. So, um, once we do the update uh, and we calculate the posterior, then my question is, how do we actually choose the next action? So do we sample from the posterior? Or is there something else? Because this is actually not said in the, in the lecture. So here I'm assuming like some random uh, next step. So uh, here are the next, uh, next action that I choose in step two is, um, is uh, the action one, in step three is the action two and so on. But uh, I don't actually, I'm not actually sure if it's the right thing to do. Seems seems logical to me to sample from the posterior and then uh, you know for the next step, and then update uh, update uh, the uh, chosen actions uh, belief. Uh, so any comments state? about that? Seems to me like this is the approach that is going to be done in the second part about the Thompson sampling and the posterior sampling. That, that, that's why I'm saying that this seems to me. <laughs> that's why I say that it seems to me that it's the thing to do, but. Uh, because actually the problem doesn't actually explain in the online course how, how to actually do this base optimal bandit belief update and so on. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's the right way to do it or if there's actually something else that, that makes more sense. Uh, 
I didn't find a paper about that. Actually, I didn't look too much. Yeah, the problem, right? The Thompson sum is uh, yes, method that has good properties. Uh, and that is it like, uh, are there other, yeah, but other it's methods? Not optimal, right? If you're talking optimal, then you have to solve so the expected reward. Oh, okay. The, right. the set of actions that will give you the maximum. Or the policy that would give you. Oh, ah, yeah, because it should. Expected. But you should, you should always sample with the. I, 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 this is where so my if you're, if you're something yeah. and you're probably not. No, not yeah, so, so I understand what you mean. But then, because we have imperfect information, so it means that uh, right now, uh, uh, at step two here, I'm going to use a pointer so that those online can see. Oh, no, the pointer is not on, sorry. Uh, how do I turn on the pointer here? Uh, uh, pointer, yes. All right, so um, so here uh, the the action one's expected reward will be higher than the action two's. The expected reward of action two will be zero uh, fifty. So it's not expected reward, right? It's an expected sum of all the rewards in the future. Ah, that's the what's. Oh yeah, I understand. I understand. So the action includes. Gathering information. Oh yeah, okay, I get it. Then you, then it's quite complicated. Then I understand. Yes. Okay. You can think of a search tree if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it now. All right. Okay, that's nice. Thank you. So, so if you want to summarize, can you paraphrase what, what was said? So if we want to do it in an optimal way, um, <laughs> if we want to do it in an optimal way, we need to look at uh, all of the exploration methods that we talked about during previous courses and then apply them to this um, but then um, I think if you want to do it really optimally you need to have an exhaustive search tree of all the possible combinations of actions that you may take in the future so here you have just two so uh, you are you are time step one and you're considering time step two uh, what if I uh, rolling all the way to the yeah, end step, yeah exactly all the way through the all the and I guess uh, you have to, uh, and if you have some infinite, uh, some, I mean, if you go on infinitely, you need to work with the expect with uh, with some stationary uh, yeah. distrib distribution. Otherwise, uh, yeah. But I understand the complication now. <laughs> I thought it's simple and it's the same as sampling. Sim Turns out, sampling it's not. <laughs> okay, so never mind. So uh, back to this. I think so. Uh, it's used anyway. Um, it can be used as the gold standard in the uh, calculation of the of a bond on the regret of of the least possible regret. So, uh, if you somehow do this, um, if it's doable, and you do these uh, these calculations, and you uh, use it on the left hand on the sorry on the right hand side in the little red square here, if you use the our our uh, base optimal belief update uh, reward, then you will get a uh, a lower bound on the on possible regrets uh, that other algorithms uh, shouldn't be able to uh, to to, uh, to improve. Like that's the best possible thing. So it's of the order of log of t asymptotically. So um, anything that um, anything that we are going to talk about further in the rest of this course is uh, going to perform. At most, as well uh, as some as So uh, this I can skip. This is what I was talking about. And um, however, in practice, actually, in practice, we have um, we have different empirical performance uh, from the theoretical optimal uh, um, bounds that are found uh, in in papers. And uh, there are, here are three three particular methods that I um, wrote down. There is the optimity exploration um, that we're going to talk about, which is theoretically optimal. So when I say yes, theoretically optimal, that means that it also has a regret of the order, an expected regret of the order of log t. Um, and uh, it has also a very good empirical performance. But here is a funny thing. When you look at some simpler method, which is uh, the greedy, um, uh, really exploration with an optimistic initialization. So what you have the initial ex, uh, the initial estimates for the arms value, which is high, 
and so that it will bias the uh, the algorithm to um, to sample uh, from all the arms initially. Uh, it will uh, it is very uh, not optimal theoretically because it's a greedy algorithm, but it has very good results on a short enough um, like on short enough problems when you have only a few thousand time steps, and um, and it actually. Uh, is on par with um, where is it? Um, I have some uh, yeah here. So for instance, the, the GRI algorithm with optimity optimization uh, alpha equals zero point point is nothing is about the uh, it's about the uh, the uh, you know the, the the factor how much of the uh, old update or how much of the old estimate we keep. So, but the GRI uh, optimistic optimization is um, actually very um, very performant compared to the UCB. This is using the same test bed as what I showed earlier with the 10 Gaussian bandits, uh, running uh, one particular theoretically optimal algorithm, which is uh, UCB, um, greedy, uh, a greedy um, algorithm with optimistic initialization, a gradient bandit that we are not going to see today, uh, but it is similar anyway to uh, or what we know about the gradient uh, policy descent, but it's a bit different though, but it's similar, it's a sort of gradient algorithm, and an epsilon greedy algorithm. So we can see that the greedy algorithm outperforms the gradient bandit and the epsilon greedy in this particular problem of 10, uh, in a thousand time steps in a, in a 10 Gaussian bandit problem. That's, that's from the uh, Barton and uh, Barton and Sutton, uh, book from uh, reinforcement learning and interaction. So what I was saying here is that, um, yeah, so the theoretically optimality is, uh, is interesting to study, but that shouldn't prevent you from trying simpler things because in particular, in some particular problems, sometimes it works very well, some, some things that are not theoretically optimal. Due to the properties of the problem, because the time steps are short enough or because of some. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so, so I, was, I was mentioning about UCB, and we are going to talk about it here. UCB is a kind of optimism-based exploration. The principle behind it is to, uh, is to be optimistic in the face of uncertainty. So you, 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 track, um, you track two things. You track the average reward per action. We, we denote it mu hat. And you track, you, you, keep, you calculate some estimate of the uncertainty that you have about each uh, reward. Uh, about you know about your average reward. So for action uh, one, you have uh, you estimate that it's a reward of zero, but you are quite uncertain about it. So for instance, here I said you, you could use a sample variance of the reward per action. So with that information, uh, we need to design some uh, some optimistic estimate of the rewards. Yeah, I, I wrote it down as a Q smiley uh, of the action. So Q smiley of the action is it's uh, it's the optimistic estimate. Of the um, of the reward value for action A, and it's the sum just of uh, the average reward and uh, our estimate of the uncertainty. Uh, we up to a certain positive constant, and I, I guess if you increase this positive constant, you are you are becoming more optimistic. Um, I'm going to later just assume that it's one, but um, so of course so what you mean specifically optimism is in a sense that exploration is good for you, right? Yep, it's yeah. optimistic because, uh, you know, you, you don't know, but you assume it's going to be good. Uh, you, you don't know how much, you, you have some quantitative estimate of how much you don't know, and you assume that it's going to be as good as it can be, given what I don't know. Okay. So, uh, so uh, given all those uh, Q smileys, Given all those um, optimistic estimates, then we take the, the the largest one. So, in general, you you have uh, here here I'm only saying low and high. So I, I mean relative to the other uh, to the other um, actions. So when you have a an average uh, reward for an action which is low, uh, you will only never select the this action when uh, the estimate of the uncertainty is also low. In other cases, you might select it. If the estimate of the action uh, value and the uncertainty are both very high, you'd certainly take, select this arm. So, 
the only reason why not to play an arm is when we know for sure that it's bad. Otherwise, we're going to play it. That's why it explores quite consistently everything until it's sure about uh, uh, about the, uh, the, the the badness of, of things. So here, uh, I was mentioning here using a sample variant. So here, it's an example of uh, using the sample variants. You have a, a uh, you have a, an estimate of your um, you have an estimate of your mu hat that is here at this particular point, and you have a variant sigma a. You are going to project on the right uh, to get the optimistic estimate. Uh, so you are going to add the variance to the to the mean, right? And um, and, and if you wanted to do a pessimistic estimate, which is a terrible idea, you would do it on the left. But here you are going to do it on the right. That's why it's it's, uh, it's optimistic. You are going always going towards the highest possible value uh, that might be. So a quick question: What happens if we adopt a pessimistic estimate? It's going to be, I think, um, a greedy. Uh, uh, you are going to take. I, I'm, I'm just thinking about it. Huh? Uh, you are going to. Uh, this is also a question. Yeah, let's think about it and then give our answers. <laughs> I think it's going to be like a very exploitation heavy approach, right? Will they explore at all? I don't think they will explore at all. It, it, in the beginning, it might, because uh, it depends on, on your initial initial value or on your prayer. It depends on your prayer. But it will just avoid all those with the highest sensitivity. No, but imagine that you take the first action, and it lowers uh, it lowers your estimate, then you take the other one because of the initialization. It's going to be similar to uh, what I said later about the uh, greedy optimistic with high initialization. So if you take a pessimistic uh, strategy, I don't know why you would do that, if you take a high initial estimate, um, then you're going to, to sample everything anyway. And then you, so there will be some initial exploration, I think. Right, so it will always take the most greedy arm, right? But mm -hmm. the greedy arm can change over time, right? So let's say you take an action A that originally has a high view, right? But then you revise your estimate because it actually gave you less than satisfactory reward. And your mu is going down over time, right? So that mu could be reduced past the, the best action, right? So then the second best would be uh, promoted as the pr preferred action, not because it's better, but because the best action got worse enough that the second action becomes the, the top contender, right? Can I say that? Yeah, but you know, the initial sigma, the initial uncertainty is quite high, and if the initial the second one is a lower outcome. Yeah, so it depends on the initial yeah. uncertainty, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, uh, let's say you have two arms, right? And then your initial arm, your initial, let's say, arm number one has high reward but high variance. Then your second arm has low reward, low variance, right? Over time, if you keep on pulling the high reward arm, but the variance is very high, it keeps on returning you actually low outcomes. Like, you, you think somebody's going to do something, but actually they never do it, right? So your expectations go down and down mm -hmm. to the point that, you, your, your confidence interval, your, your sigma is small, and the actual mean reward is also low, right? So um, then it can be eclipsed by the second best arm. Yeah, depends very much on the, on the details of the uncertainty estimates. And because like the uncertainty will drop also when you're updating that uh, for that arm, so it could be that it will get stuck on that arm even if it has a lower mu than another arm, which has not been explored at all yet. Right. So that uh, one of the problems with uh, with with a pessimistic re uh, uh, choice of uh, C, right, is that as uh, as soon as the high reward and low low uh, confidence interval, right, and it'll keep on pulling that off forever, right? It won't it be encouraged to explore, even though the variance might be high for other states. Intuitively, pessimism in the face of uncertainty means that I'm going to stick to what I know. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, very apt uh, in a Singaporean context. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, no a particular um, expression algorithm, optimistic expression algorithm uh, in, uh, in in the in the course is UCB, uh, and um, and it's. 
even simpler than what I mentioned here, that we use a sample variance of reward fraction. It doesn't use any of the actual reward data to, uh, to produce an estimate of the uncertainty of a um, new hat. It just uses um, the current time step and the number of times an action has been selected. So that means if we run something indefinitely, that means that t will increase always. So the uncertainty estimate, this whole square root term here, will increase. And uh, we will eventually end up pulling that arm again, regardless, I mean, if we don't pull it, this n of a number of times it has been selected will, will not increase, and t will increase. So we'll end up pulling it again, because this term will keep on increasing. And we are taking the r max of that uh, that value among all of the actions. So this will keep on increasing for that arm that we never select, and we'll end up selecting it again. So it constantly explores. Um, of course, uh, if um, inversely, if, if, if an arm is, is, is uh, const so often uh, selected, then uh, this will uh, this uncertainty term will reduce, and uh, and will uh, less often uh, selected. But uh, UCB is very simple. It doesn't use the data to estimate the un uh, uncertainty. Um, it's ne nevertheless, uh, it has been shown to be uh, asymptotically optimal. So I think when the prof says asymptotically optimal, he means that the expected, uh, what is regret, what is this? Uh, regret, yeah. The expected regret of the algorithm tends to the, uh, to O of log of T. Uh, because uh, I think it was written that the regret uh, tends to overflow of t, but the regret is just something that's defined just for one run. So I'm I'm not sure if it makes sense. I, I just added an expectation term because for me it makes more sense here. I meaning that uh, um, over maybe many uh, runs of the UCB algorithm, uh, the regret uh, should tend to log of t to the to something of the order of log of t. But, uh, but not the regret itself given one particular run. I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong about that. It's just some intuition. It's not partially discussed in the course. It's just what I think is right now. I do think it's quite expectation. It's more of like empirically you can observe that this lot of T seems to happen to them. That's right. I thought it was a even. Yeah. It should be even. The, 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 the lecture online says that it's a, a theoretical result that's like some sort of analytic, analytical thing. But yeah, anyway, this is the idea. So give, despite being very simple uh, in terms of its estimate of the uncertainty, it's still a, a very um, um, performant thing, you see. Uh, so this is what we were discuss discussing earlier. So that's just some, some result from another book. Um, about uh, where, where UCB kind of shines. It's in this uh, 10 gradient, 10, no, sorry, 10 um, Gaussian uh, bandit uh, test bed. Uh, well, that's all for my part. Um, yeah. So okay. before we start the next part, uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, any questions? And uh, let's first thank our speaker, Alex. Thanks. Oh, okay. Sit here. So about uh, UCB, everyone clear about how how that works because I don't, yeah now we're going over we sampling. Can go back and sampling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No questions here or online. Okay. So basically, to recap, right, the UCB is just saying that uh, exploration is a good thing. There are different ways of uh, setting the the constant C in front about which way you want to, how much you want to favor the uh, uh, exploration part, right? And I think uh, the lecturer mentioned, Sergey mentioned that um, well, you can do it with annealing, right? You can turn turn down the exploration part over time, and that's partially already done in terms of the um, uh, confidence interval, right? That uh, you pull the arm enough, enough number of times that the confidence interval of the reward should shrink, right, because you have more data samples. 
Okay. So um, I do have a question. So uh, you mentioned that uh, from based on uh, Sutton and Barto's book or other parts that uh, it works well for uh, rollouts that are about transitions that are a few thousand long. So um, is that the empirical result or is that because of the, the data set or the, no, the action space that's uh, yeah. uh, possible? Yeah, I was talking about the about the greedy web initialization. Uh, so in, in particular, this one works well for a um, a few uh, a few thousand time steps here, just one thousand time steps, uh, because um, okay, this is also on several runs of of the of the. It's not just on one particular problem instance, mm -hmm. but it's on a. Um, I don't know how many, may, several um, instances of the 10 uh, Gaussian bandit test bed. Um, it's, if, if I know that I'm going to run a, um, I'm going to, to, to be facing a bandit problem and that I'm going to be um, running it as a human, I'm going to, to be running it for a, a lot of time steps, um, let's say a million. And and what matters in the end is the sum of the reward that I get. The first thing I'm going to do is sample each action many times without too much thinking about it. Because I know that I will, um, after a point, if I just uh, sample each one time, I'm going to question my knowledge about this action. So. Um, it is a property. The reason why greedy optimistic initialization works well uh, here in this instance is because there are not too many time steps. I think so. Um, the one, the UCB, I expect will uh, start to perform better when there are more time steps, ten thousand, hundred thousand, so on, because um, the initial knowledge that was gained by uh, the greedy with optimistic initialization will be less um, less accurate than the ones gained by the by the UCB algorithm. Uh, when there are many, many time steps, because there are more opportunities for exploration. But when you're taking a greedy approach with optimistic initialization, you only have an initial um, exploration. And you don't further consider the question of whether your decisions are correct. Uh, also, if there are going to be uh, more arms, uh, there will be, it will be more probable that several of the arms will be uh, close by at the upper range of the rewards. And um, it's going to be difficult to distinguish which one is the actual best one without constantly, without, without more exploration. So I think the, the reason why it performs well here is because there are few arms and few time steps. If there are more arms and more time steps, really with optimistic initialization will almost never get the best one. However, here uh, also we need to, to question what's being looked at, the average reward, reward over a thousand steps, not necessarily uh, the, the thing that we are interested in. Maybe another thing would be the percentage of time the algorithm selects the best arm. Maybe there is this is what we're interested in. In this case, maybe greedy with optimistic initialization will perform much less well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just one particular metric that's been chosen by uh, <clears throat> by the authors, and uh, depending on the actual problem that we are facing in the in in, in real life, uh, if we are trying to apply those algorithms, it may it may make, it may not make sense. So yeah, I'm not sure if he answers the question. Yeah, in part. Do you guys have other questions? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm also interested in you know what what type of algorithm optimal given that you have a, a, a limited event horizon. So let's say you only have 100 steps in your ideas to get maximal reward. So um, do you tune your C parameter in such a way that it's sensitive to that? Right? Because if you only have a, a, a limited number of draws, I guess uh, an optimal algorithm could take a while to converge, right? That's a good question. I think that in, when you have a hundred time steps, we can consider this time the Bayesian full exploration with a modern computer. Yeah, I mean, 
in bandits, you usually think about the casino, right? Unless you're like ultra wealthy, like some people in Singapore are. Uh, my, my budget runs out in the casino very fast, so I cannot explore for very long. Right? I'll probably just give up, regret it, and then go, go to the buffet line and eat my food and go home. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's go on to the next part then. Great, thanks for clarifying for those. Yeah, sorry. Sure. So basically from the lecture, basically he's saying that this is how um, probability matching would work. So in my layman understanding, what I think it is in like the bandit case um, example, is that there is a probability distribution behind the reward that you can obtain from each bandit. And then what we will do is we will sample a probability of reward out of each of the distributions and then pick the best bandit based on the highest probability of reward from what we have sampled. And then we are going to update the probability distribution of the chosen bandit with um, the results that we got from the bandit that we chose. Yeah. So, um, I'm just thinking, does everyone have the same understanding of how that this is how probability matching would work? That you would. So why don't we take some time uh, to think about it? I mean, as a group collectively, do we agree with what's on the right hand side yeah. of the on slide? So uh, again, assume that for each bandit, so for each machine, we have a probability distribution behind the report, and we want to sample a probability of reward out of each of the distributions, right? So we have a model of our bandit, right? I think uh, we we mm -hmm. all agree that this is a model based procedure that talks in sampling is that is going to be introduced, this is going to take for that, right? And then we want to pick the best bandit based on our, our sample. So it's not optimal, but uh, given the sample that we pick, we try to do the best what we can, and then update the probability distributions, um, sorry, the, the single probability distribution for the, the bandit that we decide to put the coin in the slot machine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it says in, in, in the, the excerpt from this slide that's from Sergey, pretend the model is actually correct. Take the optimal action. So we just uh, take uh, whichever one seems to give us the best reward given our current state of knowledge and update the model. Okay. So um, I think that what they said inside the lecture is that this is actually um, although harder to analyze theoretically, it can work very well empirically. And also from the paper that he recommended, they also said that this is an easily implementable heuristic. And what it actually, um, one benefit of it is that it alleviates the influence of delayed feedback because it's randomizing over the actions. So it, um, it, it doesn't have the problem of being deterministic, like, I mean, uh, UCB it is from the optimistic um, way of uh, approaching this problem. And so these are um, recommended ways of how uh, you could implement it. And then on the right is a code that someone managed to do on Thompson sampling. And these are the results that it got. So I thought this was quite intuitive to understand how it, um, it's working. So basically, you start off with the priors. And then um, eventually, as the posteriors get updated, you eventually get a very good idea of what are the actual um, distributions lying behind each bandit. Any questions? And so um, the good part about this is that um, even though like bandit nine from the very start is already seeming to be like the optimal choice, um, there is still quite a high chance of exploring the other bandits because um, the standard deviations are still high and you can still, uh, you're still able to obtain a, prop, um, a reward of, uh, so the probability that you'll get a reward from another bandit 
um, that is higher than the one from Bandit 9, it's actually quite high. Although this would um, reduce uh, when you go uh, into may, um, like maybe 20,000 time sets, which is like the picture on the right. So what this actually means is that um, when you are at a start, like, um, nearing, like when you are at 1,000 times, that's like the one in the middle, your, um, the probability that you pick an action that actually more of like exploration type rather than exploitation is actually really high. Whereas like once you reach like 20,000 time steps, it, the, um, the probability that you pick an action that is actually of explorative nature um, drops down by a lot. And then you will be more likely to pick the exploitation strategy and that is gonna help in help um, you pick the optimal strategy in the long run. So it, it, it gives a good um, balance of exploration and exploitation through this method. So that's achieved through the sampling. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you get unlucky, so to speak, at the tail end of the, uh, the very tail end of this, um, the iterations, and you, you sample a bad reward from arm nine and a completely good reward from another arm, continue to explore in that case, right? But then the distribution wouldn't change that much. So in your next step, you would still need to sample again, and then it's unlikely that you would move away from your exploitation strategy. Right. Basically, if the, like you have a large number of time steps, you would tend towards getting the optimal. But That's right, if, yeah. you are at, if you only have a relative number of time steps, you are subject to random fluctuations. Yes. Possibly you will get. Yes. Okay. What kind of, in this paper, this is what kind of problem those are, what those bandits are at find out. Um, this was actually just um, someone's code on um, yeah, having yeah, yeah. multi-arm bandits like that are just either um, going to give you a payout or or not. Yeah. So these are these are binomial bandits. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It should be I because yeah, I found the the picture kind of surprisingly some surprisingly like wide still. Uh, uh, so, so a lot of uncertainty after 20,000 time steps about those ones because they were not, um, yeah. maybe they were not explored as much, yes, possibly. All right, so the wider distribution is like not nine, but some of the other ones there, and like the orange color one, I guess, because it's still being sampled, right? Yeah, but it's just with a much less uh, rate, so that the variance is still pretty. Yeah, and uh, understand anyway. Uh, they are still clearly separated at, at the at, at zero point one. That's that makes sense to focus on. Like. Yeah, but um, this is not a paper. This is just someone just somebody's project, post, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, at the famous hub of data science. Right? <laughs> data science yes. So um, yeah, and then. We have from the lecture about um, how we are going to do this for RL, and what he said was that um, we could actually, um, instead of sampling the parameter from the probability distribution of the bandit, if we have a Q network kind of um, deep learning, then we can bootstrap this kind of deep um, Q network in order to do this kind of sampling. So instead of sampling that probability for our reward just now, which we did, we would sample like the whole Q function. So um, that is one method um, that was mentioned in the lecture. And I think there's this other implementation from this paper where they say that um, they could um, use like the last layer of the Q network and do they um, have the priors on the weights of the Q network. So, by doing this, um, they managed to um, like kind of use Thompson sampling in that last layer, which I think allowed them to um, achieve kind of like better results than um, doing uh, bootstrapping. Yeah. So Can this is talk about that a little yeah. Bit? So this is like the results that they managed to obtain, and their their work is called the DQM. And 
Yeah. So generally, I think this is just another approach, and they seem to have gotten good results on it. <laughs> but so this is a paper from just last year. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do you guys want to take a look at it or anything like that before we go on? Uh, yeah. So we, we need we to can, know a little bit more. We can about, dive into the paper. Yeah, if, if there's time. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to ask is, um, so why would we want to do that? Is it because of efficiency? Or is it, be, uh, or is it because uh, you don't need as much uh, bootstrap samples to, to get um, effective, effective RL from that? Is it computationally less complex? I mean, the whole point is you're moving the sampling procedure directly into the network, mm -hmm. right? So you don't uh, you know, decouple the, the fact that you're using deep learning to, to run the key function, right? So you, you're sampling the key function directly, and then you're updating the parameters that generate the key function rather than just say sample work, right? So why would that be better? So in the paper, basically, I think the main um, proposition is that this is going to be more efficient. So that's why the results are in the, um, um, they, they cut it off like at the number of steps they would take to reach the same results as another implementation. So, um, like they say that, um, in SC, that's the number of samples that the BDQN requires to beat the human score. So we can see that um, that is um, like significantly less, I think, than these steps. So what they're graphing is the reward, right? The, uh, on the left, it is. And then on the right are the steps. And sample complexity. I, I know they had um, a comparison with the DDQN plus in that. So in DDQN plus, um, what they have are the scores for running it like 200 million um, times, whereas for theirs, it's like lower. And so they managed to get, um, I would say, better results with less tries. So one of their main propositions was that this is a more if efficient approach. What makes schools that are not the base schools? The no, older scores the are the best scores, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it's 3K and the reactor is 3.5K. Uh, right? the, the second to last column yeah. is folded. Right? So it's only on the algorithm. Yeah, 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 yeah that's, that's right. It's not a problem about the sample yeah. complexity. That's sort of like metadata about the problem. No, the human the also is not competing, apparently. Yeah, humans have no chance, right? No, no, they, they have. They, they, they perform better sometimes. But yeah, yeah. They perform better as you saw sometimes. This is not me, obviously. I can't play Atari <laughs> games. I used to play these games. That's how big I was. I, I remember <laughs> playing Asteroids and Assault. I think of this one. Centipede. You can There's see. something strange. All of the games' names start with A, B, and C mostly. I don't know why <laughs> they yeah. Just Pong, right? Pong is yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, yes. I don't know. They give up on the E. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They still put Pong because it's too classic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pong yes. is the, like, uh, the iris data set of reinforcement learning. No, I don't think, oh, yeah, the human does beat, right? You said uh, the yeah. role number two yeah. beats an alien. Uh, another one is the centipede. Centipede is also right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's 2018, so this year, you know, humans should like lose to everything, right? <laughs> yeah. 
maybe. Okay. I think about the other part in the paper where they talk about characteristics of uh, phosphorus sampling as long as we need and close to the exploration. I think one of the arguments they said is that Thompson sampling gives uh, both the greedy action, the estimated Q values, and estimated uncertainties, whereas epsilon greedy doesn't have the two estimations, and close to exploration does have the estimated Q values, but not the estimated uncertainties. So you saw that in the paper itself? Yeah, the paper itself, I think that's another um, benefit you, that they list for. You mean table, table one? Is table one, yes. Okay, I'm gonna it into the slab and also put it in put it here on the result on the factor. Shall we do that for a minute? Um, I will share my screen then Kishore can you help switch it over? Sure the oh, that looks terrible. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm going to try to blow it up a little bit. Um, so it's this table that I think uh, mm -hmm. you were going to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it says here, you know, you have really sampling estimated Q values from both both spin exploration and Thompson sampling and estimated uncertainties that Thompson sampling. I'm not sure what they mean by the both spin exploration. Did they say anything about that? Uh, just say uh, I mean further up. Just further up. Okay, so we're looking somewhere over here. For the QN at the at the end of the network, so if you have discrete actions, uh, then it will tell you the Q value for each of the actions. And if you choose a greedy strategy, you choose the action as the maximum Q. That's the epsilon greedy one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So the question question that we're having now is, what do we mean by Boltzmann exploration? I, I think Boltzmann is much better, much better similar to uh, then using those Q values, uh, put it through some kind of softmax function that you choose. So it's more likely to choose the action with higher degrees. That's likely you. Right. So I think that's what. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. It says here it, it has an idea of the estimated Q function, but not its uncertainty. So when we add the uncertainty to it, then it becomes like Thompson sampling, right? Because we we are modeling both pieces of information, not only the mean but the other variance. They have this uh, here, which is I think what Alexandra was highlighting before, right? So. Yeah. Right, so uh, when we have a low reward with high variance or low variance, we don't need to sample this anymore. All right, but um, in a certain case, uh, we can have something that has high variance, um, and we're going to try something like that. You know, the greedy action would uh, stick to something with a higher, higher overall mean, right? At least in the estimated Q value. So, uh, Chenting, does that address what you were asking? Yeah, and I actually also found another paper that you people want, want to know about Boltzmann X evaluation. Okay. You guys have control of the lecture. Do we have time to look at that? Uh, maybe I'll just read out. It's, okay. uh, basically, they said that Boltzmann exploration. In the most common version of Boltzmann exploration, the probability of choosing an arm is proportional to an exponential function of the empirical mean of the reward of that arm. Yeah, 
It's just a uh, right middle interaction. And then they have a ration that they divide for this paper. So I think in our context, uh, instead of the rewards for RL, they are probably So I think the argument back to the previous paper was that because they only use the empirical B, you don't actually consider the variance that you have in the answer. Mm -hmm. Right, and in this paper, um, basically putting the, the sampling procedure directly into the last layer of the DQ, right, on the feature representation. I'm not sure how that's done, but um, is there is there more room to do something smarter uh, in integration than just the last layer? I mean, usually we think of the last layer of any neural network as being the, the, all the highly engineered features before it goes into the, the soft max to the classification. So is there any, would we think there's any value in doing something uh, different than that? And this is, I'm just throwing it out there. The other thing that interests me is that, you know, when we're uh, estimating a, a Q value, you know, it's just a, a static um, network that's learning a function. But if you think about it, the Q value has to take uh, the whole transition rollout. So in some ways, it's not that smart to use a, a neural network to assemble a static function. Maybe there's some use in thinking of uh, how to customize it so that uh, it would favor uh, you know, maybe short-term rewards over long-term, but maybe that's already built into the, right? we already have that level of abstraction. Just thinking off the top. So, I mean, in, in other neural networks, we, we have some uh, things where we we want to actually pass information from previous layers all the way up, like that. If you think about inception or something like that, or ResNet, right? residual networks, we, we pass to uh, whatever is not modeled up another level, so it has a chance to be modeled. So um, here, we're sort of agnostic to what type of classifier it is. It's just some random multi-layered neural network, right? We're not saying it needs to be a ResNet or, or Inception or anything like that. But uh, you know, I think there's an interesting uh, thing to think about, that, that there are many different model architectures for deep learning. Um, and, and there's this uh, a dynamic component in the RL um, that uh, perhaps can be done better than currently being done. Yeah, so we'll go back to the presentation as to our questions. Any of you want to chip in or think about? In any case, we are decorrelating those uh, sequencing or the network can have decorrelating in terms of those time steps. Trying to make a sample of action. Um, when you do some sort of RNNs, which which might not be a bad thing I don't know um, yeah I mean it, I mean we, we have this decomposition right now that we're, we're basically saying we're just going to get the Q value so however you get the Q value is fine. And then what they're saying in this uh, 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 whatever uh, B B Q N paper is that uh, we can make this process faster by directly manipulating from the last layer rather than um, all the way after the entire network is learned. Yeah. Because I believe in the original DQN, 
we don't have the soft mics in here. They have this, uh, this like version kind of values of the people. Uh, so they, when you add a soft mic, it's kind of the one that the distribution is out rather than picking some of that the distribution. Um, maybe that's the reason. Just that they don't want to distribution. So having the distribution allows you to sample, right? Yeah. Rather than have a like a, a discrete piece. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's continue. Thanks for that comment. So the next part is about um, compression of state representation. So basically, in the lecture, he also said that. Um, you might want to um, use some kind of pseudo state count to, um, and when you do that, you can count the states using a compression function so that you can encourage collisions of similar but non-identical states, so that you'll be able to in the game identify like um, times when you are not exactly um, in the same state, but like maybe if you are you already collected the key then maybe that no matter where you are in the map maybe that should be a similar thing because the key is gone or something like that so basically i think um the main idea here is that he will he introduce um the idea that you can use a compression function to do the counting of the states so that you can um group them and then um, he also introduced this idea of using exemplar models to do that so to get the compression functions, you can actually use all of the previous states to determine if the current state visited is something that is new. Yeah. So I think this is just to augment the exploration. So did he give examples of a compression function in the cover map? Um, no, so basically his idea of a compression function is perhaps you could use a model to do that. And then what his idea was is that you can use the exemplar model to do this kind of compression. And so what he suggested was that in a simplest form is that you can use all of the previous states and then to um, to like discriminate against the current state. And if the current state is easily distinguishable from the rest, then it is a, a new state. So do we all understand what's going on? So we were talking earlier, Alex was talking about the case where we have discrete states and actions, right? And now we're moving on to the fact that we might have um, a continuous state space Right, so what does it mean for one state to look like the other state? How do you know it's similar enough that it should be counted in quotes, right? Okay. Yeah, so basically that's also the end of my part. And then the next part that we um, wanted to go through was on information gain. Okay, let's go through that, yeah. Not sure if Joel was online with he said he was going to be 10 minutes late. I'm here, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. so um, uh, you're on, so we'll switch projector to you. And then you can lead it to the show. Thanks for coming in remotely. Yeah, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog, so we don't know whether you're there or not. So, you know, yeah. 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 Uh, what he says is that it's going to be like uh, a yeah, the thing, but it's just going to use all the previous things. You just need to toggle to him, right? So you, I think locally we're fine. Uh, Joel, you need to share your screen. This share button is on the left hand side yeah okay uh, i'm sure you have echo so uh, you may want to turn off your uh, speaker at some point and we'll just try to text you yeah, it works 
Those are your words. Let's see. Okay, well we'll see. Yeah, you're not re you're not here, so there's no feedback. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, great. Well. Um. Okay. Yeah. So I guess this was the information gain. So where they mentioned that um the basic intuition behind uh using information gain as a can you click um, on present measure of oh yeah you might want to click on uh present yeah uh, yeah thank you yeah so um I think uh the lecturer mentioned that um using information gain. Uh, the intuition behind using information gain as a measure for um, making a decision was that um, having novel decisions would um, result in, in a better uh, model. So like um, in this particular scenario, like given uh, unknown variable z, you want to reduce the uncertainty about um, the unknown variable z. And you can do this by, um, you can quantify this by measuring the entropy um, of of um the uh the current z estimate and taking the difference um between that and and the estimate the the what we know about z after um making some observations about um why um where y can be like the state action to power or things like that so um yeah and then um I guess he goes on to elaborate um, about um, how information gain is used in the context of of the like uh, bandit algorithm. So over here he mentions that uh, you have a GA, um, the information gain, and then a uh, kind of a term which kind of functions which looks like a bit like regret. So you have um, you have a um, the 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 optimal case. Uh, where where you have like um um and then and then the the suboptimal case. So you have like a somewhat a term which is which is something like regret. And then um I guess you try and minimize uh the square of of that term over um the information gain. So like the rationale behind doing each of these was that um squaring the term makes it easier to reason with because you won't have to deal with negative values. And um, I guess having the uh, dividing by 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 the information gain ensures that you always take um, actions which give you which allow you to learn something about the environment. Yeah. Does anyone have anything else to add? Yeah. It's not that. I think that's it. Um, are we going through Hello. parts A and I? Ah, you want to do uh, in this order? Oh. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, what about part seven, though? Oh, yeah, part seven is done, uh, I guess. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. Let me just give me this. Yeah, okay. Um Um, yeah, okay, so it, I guess, wasn't, uh, so, like, what I got from this part was that, um, he, he was trying to say we need to decide, um, 
what exactly um we want we want to uh let me refer to my notes. Oh fuck. I think he was saying something about what type of information game do you want to know about, right? So Ah um, yes. You're trying to know whether you're gaining information about the board or the dynamics, right? Whether the uh, you're transitioning from one state to another. We need yep. to be very clear about what what exactly we want to know more about through the exploration process, right? Hello? I think in the information that gain about reward, I think uh, he says uh, not very useful if the reward is sparse. That goes back to the previous part of the lecture where we're talking about Montezuma's revenge, which is like you might be uh, going through a lot of actions, not seeing any change in the reward. So even though you're exploring by taking new action, you won't see any change in the rewards function. So that's not very useful. So what we might want to do is not think about the reward, but say, actually, we want to explore the state space, which is why the density function is a, a, a good idea, right? So uh, you can think about that. Yes. Right? It's interesting because uh, one thing that I mentioned earlier was that uh, humans will be guided by curiosity. So that's kind of similar. Yeah, that's right. So we could say uh, we, we want to figure out what's happening in a new state, but not really thinking about the rewards per se, but oh, there's some shiny new room over there that there's a door leading to a new hallway. Maybe we need that, or you know, in words of Morpheus, take the red pill or the blue pill, right? <laughs> so you can decide which one to take, right? And uh, you don't know actually where it leads, right? So uh, thinking about the state transition is a, a useful thing, right? So you don't get to observe the state directly. Um, but you get to see it, uh, observe observation, but uh, when you take an action, you might uh, go to a different state than you intended. So in some cases, uh, doing a, a particular action leads us to know more about the dynamics about whether that action actually gets to a target state that we so uh, uh, that's why modeling not specifically the reward, but perhaps more the state density or the dynamics might be a, a better thing to think about in terms of exploration and salary hmm. Um Yeah, I guess for the for this particular portion, he, he talks about um, like how information you can express information gain in in terms of um this this KL divergence term, which which is he doesn't go on to elaborate on the, the proof of it. He says um it's it easily follows, but um after which what did he say? Uh optimized variation of God. We want to put the paper. Anyone want to find the paper and put it on stack? This no proof at all paper on our variational inference, but what's MD here? Not that. Maximizing exploration. Maximizing exploration. Okay. Variational information. Maximizing. Thanks, Shenton. You guys can find it on Slack. We can all help draw out a little bit on this one. Uh.
Right. So I think here uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, uh, again, a couple of weeks ago when he covered uh, variation. What's the goal of that, right? So um, I'm going to try to share my screen and see whether we can get some of that. That's okay. No, do you want to go ahead? You're looking at your notes. So, yeah, you don't have to go in presentation mode because we all have the slide link anyways. We can follow you yeah. directly there. We need to see your notes to present. Um, just give me a second. Uh, Yeah, sorry, I'm not. I'm, I can't really recall what what was going on in this slide. Um, yeah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We'll let, let's do it uh, jointly together. I mean, it is a study group. You guys are not uh, being paid to lecture. <laughs> right, you're being you're paying to lecture, uh, which is uh, a little bit on the opposite direction. Um, so let's go to the other screen. Sorry. So, uh, right, I think uh, what he's saying is that we want to um, get the information gained for the transitions, right? So uh, we want to look at the KL divergence uh, uh, as a way of finding a practical solution to the vari variational problem, right? So. Um, So we can't calculate the posterior directly for the data set because it requires integrating through all these uh, cases, right? Because uh, there's too many uh, possible uh, outcomes. So instead, what we're going to do is exactly like we heard in the variational inference lecture a couple of weeks ago, if you recall watching that, uh, we're going to approximate it through an alternative distribution. Right, that, that was the whole idea of a variational inference because the integral is intractable. So um, you're going to approximate to an alternative distribution, right? Uh, it's Q of theta um, and uh, pi, parameterized by pi, by minimizing this divergence. So we want the two distributions to match, right? And then um, this can be done through the variational lower bound, right? Get something. Um, I'm just speaking off the cuff, so if you know better than me, please say. Uh, this is my understanding of that. So I, I don't have anything else to say here. So we'll go back. It's something interesting slide. that this modifies the uh, reward function. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, um, in line with what we are talking about curiosity. Yeah. Um, uh, this is some sort of implementation. Of that. Right. <laughs> Actually, so I was just thinking, like just now we were talking about like in terms of sampling, like to maximize the sample value from the distribution to get what is our best action. So is it in like information gain, what we are doing is that we actually want to maximize the action that brings about the biggest change from our prior to posterior distribution. That's right. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're looking at the exploration part and saying which action is going to produce the most uh, certainty, uh, change in certainty about uh, the sample space site. So I'm going to choose um, an action that's going to improve my estimate of, um, uh, of the variation uh, for a particular arms function. That's what I am. 
but it doesn't have to be just at the Q function, right? Something uh, broader than that, right? So we try to um, say, think, um, right, that uh, you're, you're trying to look at the entire, uh, I understand this correctly, the entire uh, network. Uh, the posterior distribution given the new state action pair, right? Um, and because the integral is intractable, then we're trying to, to get to, to calculate which uh, action to take through the alternative. Okay. Yeah, but I, I think you're right. It's basically to look at uh, minimizing, uh, maximizing the amount of certainty that you get out of, of doing the exploration step. So I'm just thinking like, this feels a bit like a meta-meta problem kind of thing, right? So like just now, maybe we needed 20,000 steps to reach like some kind of answer to that bandit nine is the optimal. But now if we try to instead start off with like information gain kind of strategy, then maybe we'll take less steps to yeah. Right. So I guess you can say, you know, you're trying to make do uh, more with the exploration step. Right? This is definitely not thinking about something along the exploitation step, right? Because a little information gain there, you know, definitely trying to control how much gain you get out of exploring. Okay. It's a slightly different objective, right? Yeah. But I think, um, if I'm not wrong, Joel, uh, can you correct me that this this part is in conjunction with uh, being able to encode whether the state is similar to another state? Uh, yeah, I believe so. So, it goes on to... Uh, this is the wrong... Okay. We're going to switch back to your slide deck because I... Oops. No. Yeah. This the change the most it's novel. All right, so I think it's set up there a little bit that I think the Information gain. If it changed a lot, that means that we know that the state that we're currently visiting is quite new, novel, right? So um, that, that's uh, a way of um, characterizing whether the current state that you see is actually different from something in your experience. Anyone else want to say anything about uh, this? Maybe we can go on to the next slide. Sure. So um, I think here they just summarize the, the key results of, of their paper. So like the, the orange line is, is the method that they've used in the paper. The blue line is the original result. And the, the main point in this particular slide was that um, I guess you're, you're able to achieve um, I guess decent results as compared to to the uh,
And um, I think the lecturer also mentioned that that's appeal. Oh, actually, this is in the slide. It's appealing, but the models are generally more complex, which makes it harder to use to put into practice. Um, Yeah, I don't really have much to add. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay. I do recall that um, uh, uh, Sergey mentioned that uh, the key part about choosing uh, this implementation is that you are trying to get good density estimates, right? But it doesn't actually care about the Q value per se, right? So you're not trying to get a, a good Q value, but you're trying to get a good density estimate of um, whether the state is represented or not. So if we go back one slide um, to the previous one, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, there is this diagram, right, uh, of the neural network that's being learned. Yeah, so um, you can see here we have uh, purple scores, right, um, that are discrete values. And then um, we are modeling this uh, with distributions of weights rather than the weights themselves, right? So that's the orange, uh, whatever, distributions that we see on the right-hand side of the diagram, right? And so that allows you to get a, uh, if you push all of these things through, instead of getting a single Y value, you're getting a distribution, right? So the important fact is that you're getting a distributional estimate, right? You're getting the entire distribution rather than a particular Value, right, which is, I think, what Paula mentioned earlier, right? Right. So the important part here is that we choose uh, this representation uh, through variational inference because we want to get a density estimate, not because we're looking for the particular Q value or Q function that comes out of the, the classifier. Actually, how will we implement weights as distributions instead of as values? Yeah, so that that's, I think, why the lecturer later says, you know, models are a lot more complex, right? Because now instead of having an edge that's a single floating point value or, or a clipped integer value, you actually have an entire distribution. Right? Oh, is it? Maybe it is. Maybe you're you're just doing multiple tries, yeah, you're and then you're sampling all of these to construct the distribution. Is that what you? Yeah, that's my understanding. Uh, you're rather training one model, you just train like hundred models, and you sample. That could that could be a distribution. Ah, okay. So from each network, you take its edge weights, and then you aggregate all those edge weights to form a distribution. So you might have like say twenty of the the purple networks there, and you take all the edge values for each edge, and then you form a distribution, which would be one of the orange curves. Is that right? Does that make sense? <laughs> for a deep network? And it can, like for the same index uh, weights, you, uh, you you transform it into a distribution by smoothing the samples, and then I don't know if it's reasonable for the, for the intermediate layer weights, if, uh, because I mean, there is a dependence. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I need to think about it a lot more. Working ahead of it. Yeah. So if we are not clear. Well, I'm not either. But uh, maybe we need to go at some point back to the variational uh, inference lecture. The whole point of that was because you know going through the integral was intractable, and you tried to approximate it using another distribution. Yeah. Right. And that distribution, I, I think probably is actually directly modeled in the network, um, probably not sampled, because you know all, all of our Bayesian friends prefer not to, to, to do it that way. They'll have an actual distribution at every part of the network. Right. We can look at the paper some more if you'd like. Um, Joe, do you want to continue on uh, and, and talk about the easier part, which is the introduction to transfer learning?
Uh, sure. I guess we can just finish that up. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess so. Like he was just saying that. Um, like uh, you don't like most of the time you don't want to train a network from scratch. As I mean, as in as in as similar to the case in like a CNN or or like an RNN. So most of the time you'd want to draw draw from your experience in one particular task and and try and general try and um use that same experience in the other task. So in this case, he talks about um, if you're an explorer in Indiana Jones, then you'd notice that there are certain um, key, key features that, that you would know from, from running the maze that you can extract into to this, um, playing, playing this Montezuma game, even though um, whatever you're doing is quite different. So he then goes on to describe the, the various types of learning. So you have zero short learning where you have um, no information about the target domain and then you have one shot one shot learning where you uh, run through the, the target domain once, and then um, yeah, few shot learning. So the, he then talks about how um, in RL it's a bit different from um, learning in vision where where you can't just um, you know um, freeze um, like where where you take like ImageNet and then you just remove the top few layers, freeze the rest of the layers, and then add uh, another layer and then expect it to work. I think you have to do something slightly different. Um, what else do you say? Mm. Uh, he talks about multitask learning, I think, at one point. Uh, um, then he, he goes on to give like a brief uh, introduction into like uh, progressive neural networks, like which which he elaborates more on in lecture nineteen. Um, did you watch lecture nineteen? Um, uh, not not fully. I didn't really have the the time, but um, I read this other document, I guess, which I'll I'll post later. Um, which I think summarizes the the first half of lecture nineteen. Um, yeah. Now, if you have the link. And we can uh, at least discuss it a little bit while you present the last part. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Are, are you guys interested? Because uh, we have another 15 minutes or so to go with some basic stuff on transfer. Yeah. So just, just as a refresher. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead and put it on slide. So Joe, we'll, we'll let uh, Bala give uh, a short Yep, question. sounds good, yeah. It's just random. Yeah, no, that, that's helpful. Thanks for doing that. It is a study group. You want to come over here? Too? Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Take this. I can't. Let's see how much I remember. OK, we'll help um, you. OK, so um, the the. Okay, so the idea is like we want to discuss a little bit of trans, uh, transfer learning and an application of transfer learning like a style transfer. Okay, and there is a little bit, there's code involved. Oh, I'm not sure whether I have access to it. No, let's see. Mm, okay, so the, the common scenario would, would be 
um, like we have a source task and a target task. We want to we want to learn a model, or someone already learned the model uh, for a particular task, and then we want to take the model and move it into a new task, like a target, uh, and see how it is performing. So we have a source data set, and uh, we learn a model. Uh, we will have source label, for example, and we will we'll see whether we can transfer this model into a new domain. Okay, so we, when we think about this, um, if, for example, the target task and the target uh, task data set distribution matches are somehow similar to the source data set distribution, then we can hope that uh, this model do well in the new domain. So, but for, for some reason, if let's say the, the target task data set and then the target task itself is totally different, then we cannot hope this model to to to, uh, to do better any better, um, but that's some some ideas that I got. Uh, there must be some sort of similarity between these distributions. Um, so so here, uh, different task okay, different models. Uh, in a transfer learning scenario, we have two tasks, and and let's say there's one model that uh, that does this too, and we see if we can transfer this knowledge to the new. A new task, okay, some some sort of thing. Let's keep going. Okay, the common scenario would be like you let's see what is this? Okay. Um this is uh okay. Uh, I think here is like uh, we, we take a image we take like uh, some neural net, okay. Uh, this is primarily for like uh, object detection. Whether this uh, is this, uh, like uh, what kind of object out of n objects, and then see that the, the new task would be uh, scene type identification. So uh, the task is different, but the data set distribution kind of matches. So what what we can think about take the previous model and remove the last layer and retrain it with the new data set. Uh, hopefully we can we can get benefits from the previous uh, you know model all those early layers rather than the last few layers. Mm, so that's that's an application here. Let's keep going. Um, okay, so so few scenarios whereby we can use Conrad as a feature extractor, fine tuning the Conrad and pre-trained models. Okay, so uh, so here is saying okay, you can either take a pre-trained model and uh, do some fine tuning, or you can just take a pre-trained model and just see how it behaves in the target task. Um, or you can say take a pretend model and use it as a feature extractor for your future task. It's three, three different scenarios. Um, okay, so here uh, we we are just using it as a feature extractor, which means if we go here, like we are not interested in the last uh, last layer. Either it could be a classification or regression. We are only interested in the the, the features that uh, that we are extracting from this uh, pre-trained model, for example. And um, so what? Uh, so take a connet and then remove the last layer. Um, okay. So once you extract the features, um, then train a new classifier for a new data set. Okay. So this is a typical scenario. Uh, one benefit that you can get, like uh, uh, of course, the new new uh, new for the new data set, uh, you will have a model. As long as your new model architecture matches with the original one, you can copy those weights, which uh, will help you to extract those features. Um, so this is uh, okay. So this is the one that I discussed. I can remove the last layer, and uh, I mean take the one, add a new classifier for the new task, just retrain it. Oh, we have feature like uh, feature extractor and all these parameters. Okay, fine tuning means basically you you retrain it uh, rather than uh, so when you retrain this has a tendency to to adjust your weights so to balance how much you want to believe the new data set. For example, uh, you have very little data set for your target task and you have huge data set for the source task. Uh, and um, if you want to give more priority to the small Target task, then you you can choose how much I want to retrain, and uh, so if you think about those early layers, usually will capture those common features that uh, you know. Um, then then you can control how much I want to adjust those early layers compared to the last few layers uh, in, in a normal uh, in a convert scenario. So this, um, okay. 
Uh, when it comes to fine tuning, you can fine tune all the layers or keep the early layers fixed and only fine tune the last la later layers. I hope this will make sense. Okay. So if you fine tune all the layers, which means I'm throwing away all this information, you can have a factor that says how much I want to update. You can update slowly or you can drastically update, which means you are giving more priority to the target task and its data sets. Mm. So let's let's be clear about why we were doing this. So, um, okay. Do you guys want to discuss a little bit why we would want to do fine tuning, or, or why would we want to remove the just the top level? So what what what's the benefit of going uh, just removing the top level, of, or as opposed to farther down in the original source domain model? So you don't have yeah. um you don't have to retrain the the the. Lower layers, which tend to capture the more like general features. Yeah, so I guess you would re reduce training time. That's for one, and and you probably get similar or better performance with with that same amount of time. Right. So in vision, actually, visually appealing to think about the, the features uh, cascade at each level to be more and more complex features. Right. So at the beginning of the CNN architecture for vision, you would be looking. More things like edges, uh, gradients, and things like that, right? And then further up, you would see composite features like corners and, and textures, and then further up, even objects, right? Other objects, right? So uh, when you truncate the the network at some level, then you're saying I discard all the the uh, features that are being explicitly uh, engineered for that particular task, yes. right? And then you're saying, okay, well, I'm going to Use everything below that as initialized weights or initialized features. So don't fine tune that means you're accepting the features that were engineered for the primary task as uh, being relevant to your task, right? If you're doing fine tuning, you're saying, well, let's use those as an initialization parameters. Just like if you randomly initialize a, a neural network, that doesn't usually work well. And so when, when we do training of deep neural networks, anyways, we do it. Uh, layer by layer, right? We, we train the bottom layer, and then we fix that and train the next layer, and fix that and train the next layer. So that, that pre-training is essential to how well a deep neural networks do, right? And then after you uh, pre-train all the layers, then you do a full training for, uh, over the entire thing to fine tune, and that usually works well. Right? So um, there's this, um, uh, I guess, balance between deciding where to truncate the network and how much, as Bala pointed out, how much you want to trust the initial parameters of the network versus the, the, the amount of update that you're going to do in the time. But again, just like Bala said at the beginning, we are assuming that um, this target domain is small. You know, you don't have a lot of samples. You don't have enough to overcome this sparse problem with uh, needing to train an entire neural network. So, yeah. So let's see. Um, so fine tuning. Okay. So either uh, we can have like a different uh, the control. Like like uh, let's say I have ten layers. Um, maybe like the first few layers I have a very uh, you know less update, and then the later layers I have a huge update. For example, this is just a differential learning rate way of uh, updating those uh, the you know changes uh, like um, for the adapt to the new task. Right. So if you, yeah, you can control this. If you set it to zero, which means no update, like, you know, you can control yeah. that. Um, Finding all the layers, I think we talked about this. Uh, early layers with le low learning rate, and then later layers with more, stuff like that. Mm, yeah. Um, so let's see. OK, so this is kind of like a rule that says, when do you want to do that? So. Um, so if the da okay, so here the data set similarity versus the data set. This uh, is the target data set, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the data set is really, really big, and there's no mm, similarity. Then yeah. you need to do the upper right, left hand quadrant, right? Yes. Because you have no choice yeah. to retrain the retrain. entire network. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is it's like putting everything into one picture. Uh, yeah, so this is basically the same thing. Yeah, again, to save some time, you do transfer learning. 
I give the distribution matches. Mm. And uh, in form of checkpoints in GitHub, and there is this thing called model zoo. We can go get some models and its weights. Um, this is just depicting a typical scenario. Uh, load a pre-trained model, replace the last few layers, retrain them, and, and prediction and, and stuff like that. Okay, so roughly we you know what's what. Okay, so what are we transferring? Like in this scenario. Okay, so if you are thinking about this, we are transferring all those weights. Uh, one thing that we cannot do, uh, if let's say you come up with a crazy architecture that uh, that uh, sort of like some sort of new architecture, um, then um, you know the then if the architecture doesn't matches from the source, let's say there is a nice ResNet architecture, whatever ResNet 50, and you take a pre-trained model, uh, we cannot do that. We cannot transfer that knowledge to a target uh, different architecture. The architecture must match. Um, so because we are literally copying all those weights from every single layer to this to the, to the target. Um, so the both models must match for this transfer learning to be successful. And uh, so this is just a visualization of all those features. Uh, so the early layers, the reason why they're saying is first prof mentioned, uh, the early layers are detecting those edges and textures and patterns. The later layers are more specific to the objects uh, or the task in hand or whatever the task that we're trying to do. Mm. Uh, so if we, this is what we're we are hoping to transfer. Um, and then the last few layers, uh, yeah, so you can take the last layers and randomly initialize them and use about a train. Um, mm. Okay, so there are some limit. Okay, so yeah, I think I mentioned this. Uh, the architecture must match. A bigger architecture, the small one. You know, you cannot copy all those weights. Um, I believe so. Um, I'm not sure they have time. Let's just see. Okay, so. so uh, yeah. Joe, do you have anything else you want to go over from the rest of the slides before Bala continues? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if not, uh, I'll briefly go into this one. This is uh, this is quite interesting because it's um, it's it's an application on top of what we learned just now. So uh, so if you guys uh, Google like style transfer, this is one of the you know earliest. Um, uh, paper that came out is um, like you give two pictures and uh, it will generate a new one. It's not GANs, it's just literally doing gradient descent, um, you know, trying to balance the style and then the content. So, so basically, we need to come up with two losses. Uh, given a picture, this is the content and this is a style, for example. Um, okay, so that to copy the content, we can literally take the content image and put it there with no style. And then later on, we slowly move the style of this image towards the content. That's the idea. So, um, so the idea here is you take this image and you do literally gradient descent on that image to minimize the style loss. So it's quite interesting. Let's see. Um, so, um, so we, uh, so the new image would have the style of the first image and then the content of the second image is R. Uh, so, so you, you're going to use this uh, content as a feature extractor for a given image. I uh, see. Okay, this is straightforward. Okay, but the thing is, like, uh, to extract content, it's obvious. Like, you you take a content, you do a for uh, like for propagation, you extract all those features. So content is obvious. Like, you know, we have object detection and stuff like that. But to extract style, it's it's a uh, it's a bit different. Um, so uh, let's see. To take a pre-trained model, remove the last layer, and then for a prompt. But to get a feature map for all the layers, okay. Mm. I think content is easy. Style is uh, style okay. is texture. Yeah, style is the early early layers. That's yeah, the style is like uh, the correlation between each features. So they use something some like uh, correlation uh, across all these feature maps uh, in a content. We'll see. Mm. So, for example, you got an image, you have a CNN model, and then you feed through it at the later layers. Hopefully, those feature vectors are good enough to quantify what is this content and uh, you know whatever the class we are, they're interested in. So that's the content representation. So what we can do is uh, we can take an image and feed through it and extract these features. And um, if you let's say we have two images, uh, two images, both of them are CAD, for example, 
you feed it through this network and you extract the feature at this layer. If you compute the difference between these two, they should be close, or like let's say the difference is almost zero for both cats if they are similar, right? So that's the, that's, uh, that's the idea for the content representation. Um, so what they did actually in the paper, they, they, don't, they not only uh, extracted the last uh, you know, one layer, they extracted a bunch. Uh, so this is just to explain the VGG architecture. Like they have this con blocks, like con11 one one and con12, a bunch of blocks. So there's one, two, three, four, five blocks. Each of them are like stacked. Okay. Uh, then, then let's let's think about the content loss. So uh, so from the content image and then from the target image. So you feed both and then extract those features, uh, the later layers, and then you compute the difference between uh, what is. Uh, of the content image and the target image. Uh, that's that's uh, this idea. So typical mean squared error, but uh, the features are from the TC is for the target and CC is for the content image, the features in these layers. Okay. Um, that's how we quantify the content, which is straightforward. Uh, and how do you optimize just use back propagation, gradient descent? Uh, we will figure it out. But for the, uh, for the style, it's a little different. Um, so, um, so, so for the style, they were interested in uh, you know finding a correlation between the feature maps. So, feature maps is nothing but those features that we extracted uh, in all those con blocks, convolution blocks. Mm. So, um, so how they quantify uh, sort of like style is like uh, what is the color in it? What is the texture in it? Is there any edge and stuff like that? Uh, but how to quantify it? Uh, so they introduced this concept of uh, this concept of let's keep going. Uh, this concept of gram matrix, whereby uh, let's say uh, you take a input image and then um, this is like convolution layer, for example. Uh, for one feature map, you just flatten it. For example, take one feature map in any of the convolution block. You flatten it like this, and, um, and then we compute the Let's say for the for a bunch of feature maps, we just flatten like this. Uh, then we do a dot product within the flattened version, which we are computing the correlation between each feature maps. Okay. So and and then like uh, with this this gram matrix gives you um, how each feature is correlated towards itself uh, in in a, in a single feature uh, feature map, for example. Uh, Do we get that concept here? You guys covered this before. Yeah. Yeah. So the gram matrix is basically helping you calculate the similarity mm. to to images. two images, right? Um, and, and along with diagonal, you have the self similarity, right? So this is also used in SVMs a lot. Mm. Basically, the gram matrix is when you're taking two data points, you want to know how similar the two data points are to each other. So um, each each um, Coordinate in the gram matrix mm. is calculated. Yes. So in this case, this will tell you of all these two features are. Um, and then, uh, so then, then what they did, like, um, so to compute the, uh, so, so we have a bunch of uh, features. Uh, and then they mentioned, like, for the features, they are interested in the early layers because early layers captures colors, edges, and stuff like that. So for the style, we are interested in the early layers. Um, and not only the same single block, a bunch of blocks. Um, so, um, so here you can see that uh, this is uh, alpha is just a, is a how much you want to capture the style, for example. And this weight wi is like how much you want to control the style across each layers. For example, uh, let's say these four different blocks, how much I want to extract. Okay, that's the weight wi. Uh, TSI and the um, SSI is nothing but the target image. And then the style image, uh, gram matrix. Okay, uh, that's all there is to it. And so with this control of how much you want to uh, control the style, um, then we put together both losses, like content loss and then the style loss, and we want to minimize these two. Okay, um, so that's the total loss. And even if you want to control, there is another hyperparameter like alpha and beta. Uh, there's this ratio to control uh, how much of the style that you want to transfer or how much of the content that you want to transfer. Like if you want to balance that, uh, that's that's the that's this. 
these are hyperparameters um, and these are like uh, the standards I mean like some uh, common ratio that they use like uh, you know alpha or beta and uh, this is showing you um, for different values I know uh, here is like too much of style and here is like it's still preserving the content with that, uh, that control yes um, Okay. Yeah, I will share this code. You can have a look yeah, at it. Yeah. We can put it on Slack and then uh, ask some people if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think uh, Bala came from the previous class where uh, that class we also did a little bit of uh, yeah. uh, vision and style transfer. So that was part of the earlier 61. Okay. So uh, let's thank all our presenters. So unfortunately, we are not going to go through uh, the 19th lecture, which does more of the transfer learning parts. So, but Joe has kindly put on um, in Slack uh, the the Taylor 2009 paper, which describes uh, transfer learning and reinforcement learning. But that's pr prior to uh, deep learning methods. So uh, you know, it's a it's a good primer uh, to start with. Okay. So next week we have our week 12, and um, we hope uh, you're getting along with your projects. Um, I will be very shortly, hopefully um, today or tomorrow, circulating information about how to get your posters printed. Um, and so that means you uh, can use the template that we will circulate for the 6101 course for your poster, but you don't have to uh, use that particular template. It's just um, it's good to have the template because it recognizes the, the the sponsors for that event, uh, which are sponsoring the food as well as the, the poster printing. Okay, so I will post that into Slack on the uh, projects channel uh, when that's available. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we are finished for today. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, that's right. You can come a little earlier if you wish to set up, but uh, you don't need to. Um, and ostensibly, it ends at 10. Uh, and uh, there's usually some time for some awards at the end. But I know a lot of people are very busy towards the very end of the semester. So if you don't show for that, that part, it's OK. Uh, but it's nice if, if you are around. So if you can calendarize it, plan to be there from 5 until 10, 10.30. But uh, we totally understand if that's too late. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.